Good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to this special Black History Month conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, made possible with support from Biogen, EMD Serono, Genentech, and Bristol Myers Squibb. I'm your host, Monique Fraser, and I'm one of the Home Care and Emergency Assistance Grant Coordinators for MS Focus. And I'm joined by Dr. Mitzi Williams, who will be talking to us about disparities in healthcare for people of color. After the presentation, Dr. Williams will open it up for questions and comments. Um, please make sure you hold all your questions and comments until the end of the presentation. Um, now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Mitzi Joy Williams is a neurologist and the founder and CEO of the Joy Life Wellness Group Multiple Sclerosis Center in Noonan, Georgia. In this position, she provides personalized multiple sclerosis care delivered with expertise, compassion, and joy. Dr. Williams has over 15 years of experience in the field of multiple sclerosis. She received her undergraduate degree in neuroscience and behavioral biology from Emory University and her doctor of medicine degree from Morehouse School of Medicine. She completed her internal medicine internship, um, neurology residency and multiple sclerosis fellowship at Georgia Health Sciences University in Augusta, Georgia, where she also served as chief resident of the neurology residency program. She has spearheaded and participated in multiple steering committees and work groups to further research in underserved populations with MS with a focus on the African American population. She also has recently joined efforts to increase diversity in clinical research and educate the community about the importance of research participation. We're very pleased to have her join us to present this very important topic. Um, Dr. Williams, thank you for being with us and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Monique, and good evening, everyone. Um, I'm so excited and delighted to be here. Thank you to uh, MSF for inviting me to talk about this very important topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share a few slides and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, so just make sure you put those questions in the chat box um, and we'll go from there, all right. So let's dive in. Okay. All right. Can everybody see the screen? Yes. Give me a thumbs up. <laughs> Perfect. All right. We like thumbs up. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about um, disparities in healthcare for people of color. We will focus this specifically on multiple sclerosis. And as I said, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end, especially since we have a nice intimate group. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully we'll get into a robust discussion before uh, we close out today. Mm -hmm. All right. So... Let's go here. All right. So when we think about the face of multiple sclerosis, this is the face that comes to many people's mind. Um, and I was just speaking with someone the other day and talking about during my training, you know, we were taught that MS most commonly occurred in young white women. And although that is still the most common face of MS across the world, we're seeing MS kind of present differently here in the United States. So we're seeing a lot of different people with MS, um, especially people of different um, and very diverse ethnic minority backgrounds. So when we look at the prevalence of MS around the world, um, certainly, you know, if you've heard, you know, that there is more MS the further away you are from the equator. So certainly in Europe over here on the right side of my screen, uh, you can see the highest prevalence um, of MS, meaning the higher number of people or the highest occurrence of MS is in Europe. But we can see that North America, the US is not too far behind. So the numbers in the US are somewhat similar to what we see over here on the right side throughout the rest of Europe, and Canada has a little bit more of a higher prevalence than North America. What is really not understood is what's going on with MS in Africa, right? Um, so there are very, very cute few case reports of MS in um, African nations, um, even in those that are, you know, much more industrialized and have university centers, et cetera. Um, we don't hear as much about MS, and so there's a lot we don't understand about the occurrence of MS. Um, in the African continent, except that it's rare. 
So what about here in the United States? So there was a recent study in 2019 uh, that was sponsored by the MS uh, Society that suggested that close to a million people um, in the United States live with MS. And this was really important because before then we didn't really have good numbers. We were just kind of guesstimating. And uh, I sometimes laugh with my colleagues, seems like every 10 years, uh, we would double the number. So, you know, when I first came out of school, it was 200,000 people in the U.S. with MS. And then, you know, a little bit longer, you know, after I've been practicing, somehow it became 400,000 magically. But we finally got a study that said not only was it more than 400,000, it was over double um, what we thought it was, um, over 900,000 um, people in the U.S. Um, with multiple sclerosis. So it's a lot more common than we previously thought. So the face of MS that we see here in the US, especially in my practice, is a face that looks like this, okay? So we know that the incidence for MS in the United States is thought to be highest in African-Americans. And this is research that's really just kind of come about in the past 10 years or so. Um, and so before then, and still now, there are a lot of people, um, even some of my colleagues who may be a little um, older or more mature, who still don't really think that MS occurs in Black people. And so I've had multiple people come to me when diagnosed and say, my doctor said I couldn't have it because I'm Black. But we know that not only do Black people get it, the risk is higher in Black women. And there are also some differences in the outcomes that we see between the groups. So sorry, that went too fast. OK, hold on, sorry. I'm skipping through too fast. Okay, so this is a slide that shows the incidence, okay, the occurrence of MS here in the US. And basically what we see is the green bar is uh, black people. Uh, the dark blue bar is white people. Uh, the kind of turquoise or uh, sea blue bar is uh, Hispanic Latino populations. And then Asian is the smallest bar. And what we see is that the highest bar is in black people. And that's primarily driven by women. So when we look at the uh, slide looking at women, we can see that there's a much larger difference between white women and black women versus white men and black men. There's just a little bit of a difference there. So that's primarily being driven um, by more MS in women. And so here comes the big question. When we talk about ethnicity, how do we determine ethnicity, right? And the honest answer is, you tell us, right? So there have been multiple instances in the news recently where someone said they were Black and because they had their hair a certain way and talked a certain way, people assumed that they were Black and come to find out they weren't Black, right? And then, of course, um, you know, when you think about the Hispanic Latino population, you know, there is white and non-white Hispanic, right? Um, and so there are all these variations and there's not really a good way for us to determine ethnicity. Well, there is, but generally it's determined by what you say. And then it becomes even more difficult of when, people, when we were talking about people of mixed race, because oftentimes we force people to check one box when they may need two or three boxes to check. So in that vein, what does it mean to be African-American, right? So we know that uh, the average person who identifies as African-American, meaning African descendants of slaves um, here in the US, um, has about 20% uh, of their genes are from European ancestry and about 70 to 80% are African ancestry. And certainly there are many variations in between. What does it mean to be Hispanic or La uh, Latino or Latinx in the US? Again, uh, very, very different. I don't know where my slides are a little wonky here. Very different backgrounds, right? So there is Mexican, right? There is Cuban, uh, there's Puerto Rican, uh, which has uh, a lot of African genes. There are some that have more European genes, some that have more Amerindian genes. So again, Ethnicity becomes a very complex thing when we really look at it on a biologic basis versus just looking at characteristics, how someone's hair looks or how someone speaks. You know, there's a lot more that goes into it than just the things that we physically see. 
So thinking about the characteristics of MS in certain populations, looking at um, African Americans in particular, um, there are multiple studies that suggest that MS actually can be more aggressive in Black populations. So some suggest that there is um, more disease progression in terms of more lesions or spots on MRI. There's more shrinkage of the brain. There is more um, disability earlier on. So African Americans may have walking disability up to six to 10 years earlier than their white counterparts. Um, and so there's a lot of research that suggests that the outcomes are more severe. However, the thing that we don't understand is how much of a role does the biology play in that, meaning are there biologic differences that are causing these outcomes? And how much do social determinants of health play um, in terms of access to care, being able to get to the doctor? How do those things play into what we see in terms of outcomes? Okay, and what about characteristics in the Hispanic population? So certainly there's a younger age of onset in that population. They do have a significantly lower risk of MS than uh, the black population, but they do have some similar characteristics in terms of having more walking disability and having MS affect the nerves to the eye in, in terms of vision, as well as the spinal cord, which can affect mobility and walking. And then we also see, uh, something that we call longitudinally extensive spinal cord lesions, right? Say that three times. Uh, but basically what that means is they have very long lesions in the spinal cord, which can lead to a lot of disability and can get confused with other diseases that are similar to MS. Something else that's very interesting is that the timing of migration for those who are not born in the US may affect levels of disability. So the later in life someone migrates to the US, the more significant disability they may have if they're Hispanic or Latino background. Now, one of the things that really um, has kind of struck me and that I make sure I present um, at every talk that I do uh, talking about health disparities is this slide that talks about mortality. Um, and so when we look at, um, this is an interesting study that one of my colleagues, one of my friends published, um, looking at mortality uh, for people living with MS. So they looked at people whose primary cause of death was listed as multiple sclerosis. And what we see is that overall, um, white populations did have the highest number of deaths overall, okay? And that's the light blue line right here where my pointer is. But when you look earlier on in life, right, this is age, when you look earlier on in life, here starting at age 15 up until about age 40, 40 or 45 or so, we see that the rate is higher in Black people, okay? Um, so we see that there is more mortality or death from MS earlier on in life, which may be because of higher disease burden or more difficulty with their MS. And then just, to, just for kicks here, I threw in a slide about COVID-19 because this is very relevant. And I think it's very interesting that looking at the data here in the US, we have a big conference every year that's usually in Europe, but was virtual this year. And what we found, um, or what some of my colleagues researchers found from the COVID-19 MS registry here in the US, is that there were several factors that were associated with poor outcomes um, in people with MS here in the US. One of them was older age. Um, another was if people had progressive disease, they tended to have poor outcomes. They had higher levels of disability. Interestingly, people who were not on disease modifying therapy tended to do worse from COVID-19 as from this registry, um, which, you know, when the pandemic first you know, uh, came into play, we were very concerned about disease modifying therapies and then putting people at risk. But we actually found that people who were not treated seemed to have a worse time. But here that second to last bullet point, black patients, okay? So even within the MS registry, right? So we know that around the US, we've seen disparities in terms of people um, of ethnic minority backgrounds having worse outcomes with COVID, but even among the MS population with COVID, we see that black patients tend to do worse. They did not have higher mortality, right? So they didn't die more of COVID, um, but they had more disability and had to be hospitalized more. And then finally, we saw that certain medications um, are our, our uh, B-cell therapies um, tended to have poorer outcomes as well. 
And so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to kind of figure that out and flesh that out. But those are just kind of some of the preliminary findings from some of our registries. So when we think about access to a neurologist by people with MS, this is extremely important when talking about health disparities. Um, because uh, if you see a neurologist, you're more likely to be on treatment or at least have access to or understanding of the treatments available for MS. You also are more likely to have a plan in terms of symptom management, which can affect your quality of life. And so this was an old study, but I think it's still relevant that suggested that there are certain characteristics of people in the US who are less likely to see neurologists. So certainly if you don't have health insurance, um, those who are a lower socioeconomic status, and again, the third one, African-American, right? Of course, people living in rural areas because they may have difficulty traveling, and those who have a very long history of illness over 15 years may not see a neurologist as often. And this was another study that looked at neurologic care overall, right? So looking at racial disparities in neurologic uh, health care. And this was not just about MS. This was about, this was all comers for neurology. So stroke, seizure, you know, all neurologic problems. And it still found that African-Americans were about 30 percent less likely to see a neurologist in clinic, okay? So there are definitely some issues with people being able to access care. And certainly underserved populations does not just include minority populations with MS. We just published um, a, uh, I just was a guest editor for Practical Neurology, which is one of our neurology magazines. And we talked about underserved populations and we included a couple of groups that you probably would not traditionally think of as underserved, but certainly they are in MS. One of them was men, right? Um, men are underserved with MS, people over the age of 55, um, because they're often excluded from our studies. Uh, and then of course we talked about um, Hispanic, Latin, ex-Americans, as well as um, African-Americans. So there are a lot of different groups that we need to, to work on improving access to care. So when we think about factors to, to consider when caring for minority patients, these are some of the ones um, that I do express, you know, are very important to my colleagues. So certainly cultural and religious beliefs can affect care that's received, socioeconomic status, um, meaning, you know, when we order tests, we have to think about what people can afford and also in terms of treatments. Also, um, poor diversity in clinical trials, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, is extremely important because when we talk about the therapies that we have, we don't have a lot of diversity in our trials. So most of our trials are conducted in Eastern Europe. So we don't have a lot of black patients. We don't have a lot of diversity in terms of age. And so how do we ensure that the medications and the therapies that we are creating actually adequately treat everyone if everyone's not included in the research? And so that's a big question. And then of course, for um, minority populations, especially African-Americans, there's the issue of distrust of the medical system. There's a very long history of discrimination and unfair experimentation, especially in the African-American community. And we have to acknowledge that um, to establish trusting relationships uh, with the people that we serve. So social determinants of health, why are these important, right? Um, and I just kind of paused here because when we talk about disparities in care, these are many of the factors that affect the type of care and how frequently people receive care. So access to um, educational opportunities, access to healthcare services. If you live very far away from a hospital, you may be less likely to seek care or far away from your doctor's office. Transportation options, right? Um, for those who live in rural areas, if you live two hours um, from your office, and I work at a referral center, so I very commonly have people drive several hours to come and see me. You have to get off of work, right, and basically take a day to come to the doctor, uh, depending on your level of disability or your willingness to drive in Atlanta traffic, uh, which many people are not willing to do. Uh, sometimes you have to get a friend or a family member to take off work. Both of you have to take off work to come to the doctor. So that can be um, a big burden, social support, right? Depending on your level of ability, you may need help getting to the doctor. If you don't have that support, you may not be able to get there, um, as well as to keep up with your treatments, et cetera. And then of course, language can be a barrier, especially for those who are not primary 
primarily English speakers, and then access to mass media, right? There are a lot of opportunities that we have through social media and through other outlets. Um, and telemedicine has become a huge factor since the pandemic. And if you don't have access to be able to uh, use telemedicine effectively or don't know how to use the technology on your phone or don't have a computer, it can really cut you out of the medical process. So their social determinants of health are huge and lead to a lot of the disparities that we see in the types of care um, between different groups as well as the outcomes. Um, this was a study that I was very fortunate to uh, be a part of, uh, and it was uh, in, in the early two, it was published in 2014, but we looked at, I don't know why my slides are doing that, but we looked at um, the number of papers focused on minority patients with MS. Um, when I first started doing talks with the MSF, about MS in the African-American community way back when. I've got a lot more gray here than it looks like I have. Uh, but when I first started doing talks way back when, I literally could print every article about MS in Black patients and put it in one notebook, okay? I could fit it all in one three ring binder. That was how little information there was. And we did this search and we looked at all the articles about MS that were published and uh, there were over 50,000 written in English and out of those, only a little over 100 were about African-Americans with MS. And only 23 at that time were focused on Hispanic Americans uh, with MS. And certainly these numbers have increased, but it still represents less than 2% of all the literature that we have about MS. And we can see from the earlier parts of the talk that there were differences in outcome. And so we have to try to figure out how we can get more information um, about these populations that are having poor outcomes through our clinical research. Okay. Good. So clinical trials, minority patients comprise less than 10% of clinical trial participants, um, which is a very, very small number. If you look at MS, it's much less than that. I have some slides that I didn't put up through here um, that have the actual numbers of minority patients in clinical trials. Um, in our major MS clinical trials, and usually the African-American patients are somewhere around 10. So we usually have about 10 people in most of our large phase three clinical trials where drugs get approved. And there might be like 40 or 50 Hispanic um, Latinx American patients. And so how can you make a generalization about how effective or how a treatment affects a certain group when you only have 10 people to work with? It's impossible. So we've got to do better um, in this area. And interestingly enough, I've done some work with the MS Minority Research Partnership Engagement Network, say that three times fast. Um, and we did a great survey, actually just got published. So I need to update this slide deck because our, our paper just got published. And we did a survey of over 2,600, close to 3,000 people with MS. And we asked them about research, you know, kind of what their thoughts were about research. And overall, we found that the, the even in the, we had over 200 Black patients and we had over 200 Hispanic Latinx American patients, and we found that most people had a positive view of research. The two biggest issues were their doctors didn't ask them about it, and they didn't know where to find out about studies, okay? So uh, the willingness is there, but somehow we have to kind of bridge the gap and get the information to people so that they can get involved. And why is it important to increase diversity in clinical trials? Certainly, we know that minorities are underrepresented in our trials, and those differences can bring a richness to the research to help us understand conditions better, but we can't really generalize findings um, and say that this applies to everyone if everyone was not a part of the study. Um, I'll quickly go through this barriers to recruitment. Um, you know, so certainly uh, we talked about lack of awareness about opportunities. You know, certainly there is in, in many cases lack of trust of the research community, cost, right, taking off work to go to studies, and then there are institutional barriers such as. Uh, provider bias, um, you know, doctors may not ask, the way the studies are set up may automatically exclude some populations. And then they may just choose uh, sites for the studies that are in the same places that don't have very diverse populations. And these are some strategies um, suggested by the FDA um, to, uh, and I won't go through these at length because I'm 
getting close to the end of my time. So what about the future? Okay, I think that there is hope, right? I'm very excited about many of the amazing things that are going on in the field of MS. So, I, you know, the first thing I would say is encourage everyone to take control of their health. You are your own best advocate, right? So when you're diagnosed with MS, you know, try to learn as much as you can about your diagnosis. Beware of Dr. Google now um, and beware of some of those uh, Facebook chat groups. Um, but certainly there are many great places such as the MS Foundation's website website, the National MS Society, the MSAA. There are lots of great places to get good, solid information about your diagnosis and knowing about your treatment options. It's also important that whatever plan you and your healthcare provider come up with to stick to it so that if you have problems, we know it's because the plan is not working, not because you're not participating in it. Um, I always encourage people to incorporate a diet, a healthy diet and exercise into their routine, which can help many of the symptoms of MS as well as help their well being. And then if you have issues or concerns, talk to your healthcare team about it, you know, and ask for help when you need it, which I think is huge. Um, especially for many of us independent men and women um, who are used to doing things on our own, it's important to know that you have help. Also, maintaining brain health is extremely important. So uh, maintaining brain health is very similar to maintaining uh, your own physical health. So physical activity, a healthy diet, um, not smoking, and also limiting alcohol intake. Um, I'm a huge fan of yoga and meditation for a variety of reasons listed here, but it certainly can help many of the symptoms of MS as well as help with things like concentration and focus and decreasing mental stress, which can affect MS. And then also addressing anxiety and depression is very important, especially in minority communities, um, especially in the Black community. I can say there's a lot of stigma that's still attached to receiving mental health services. And so I encourage my patients, you know, um, I encourage everybody to see a therapist or a counselor if they need it. Um, and we have to address those symptoms because often they overlap with MS symptoms and can be confused for worsening of MS if there is untreated or unaddressed depression and anxiety. Um, other amazing initiatives that are going on include the Minority Research Engagement Partnership Network, which I spoke about a little bit earlier, which is focused on both Black and Hispanic Latinx uh, patients. We're also looking to expand uh, to look at Native American patients as well as Asian patients in ways that we can advocate for those community. And we created some educational tools to help researchers to uh, think about diversity and to try to uh, make culturally appropriate conversations about research with their patients. Also, uh, in September, we rolled out the first National African American Multiple Sclerosis Registry, uh, which I'm very excited about. I've been working with some of my colleagues for many years uh, to, to see this come to fruition has been extremely exciting. Um, and we have over 150 patients enrolled in this registry and patients can go online and enroll in the registry um, and answer questions about their MS so we can better understand. And then finally, one of the other big things that I'm excited about is a CHIME study. So this is the first uh, clinical trial that is focused on minority patients. Um, we're looking at African-American and Hispanic uh, American patients with MS, um, and they are being treated with one of our approved MS therapies. And we're able to look at um, the efficacy or effectiveness of that therapy and also look at other things such as their risk factors for MS to try to better understand why we see some of the outcomes that we see in these populations. So I'm super excited about that. We've been rolling in that uh, since January and things are going very well with that. And so how do we move forward? So certainly improving uh, patient education, encouraging self-advocacy, um, making sure that resources are available to people living with MS uh, to advocate for themselves and to understand their options, as well as um, promoting the importance of research and raising awareness in the medical community about culturally appropriate conversations with their patients um, so that everyone can get the best care that they need for their MS. And finally, that's my second to last slide. I'm the nerdy neurologist, and I always end my talks with, all I need is peace, love, and a freaking cure for multiple sclerosis. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, and I'm happy to field any questions or take any questions. Well, thank you so much for that, Dr. Williams.
Thank you. Yeah, so now we're actually, we're ready for questions, as Dr. Williams said. Um, if you have a question or comment, um, please just use the raise hand feature in the app or send your questions via chat. Um, we, I see that we do have some in the chat already, but to raise your hand, um, you can click the screen to pull up the menu, select the more, um, select more, the icon with three dots and click the raise hand. Um, I will un unmute you and then a button will appear on your screen asking if you want to allow me to do that. Um, so I guess we can go ahead and start with some of the questions in the chat. Um, so we have one from Angela and she did put um, age specific MS mortality. Could it be that the higher attribution of deaths due to MS in white Americans is because of the holdover belief that other races don't get MS as the same numbers? Um, so it's a possibility, but not likely, right? So, so African Americans still represent a minority of people in the US, right? And so when we talk about the incidence and risk of MS in certain populations, what we mean is that for the number of people, the amount proportionate to that number is higher. It doesn't mean that the overall number is higher. So for instance, if there are, for instance, in our survey, if there are um, 3,000 people and 200 of them are Black and 200 of them are Hispanic Latino, um, if we say that the risk is higher in the Black patients, that can only, re that could represent, let's say, 150 patients, but in the white population, it could represent a thousand people, right? So it's proportionate to the number of people. Um, and so the overall numbers are higher because there are more white people in the United States than there are black people with MS. Um, but what we're most concerned about is that the risk is the highest in, in black patients. All right. Hopefully that answered the question, hopefully. <laughs> if not, feel free to pipe up and, and, ask, and ask in person if I didn't clarify. <laughs> Thank you. So we actually have another question from um, Angela mm -hmm. as well. Um, and she did okay, put, sure. um, also, as we consider healthcare disparities among um, people of color, what role might downplaying pros patient reported outcomes from these populations play in disparities, particularly if there appears to be little change upon clinical data? Mm, okay, Look, read that one more time for me. Read that one more time. Sure. Um, so she put, um, also, as we consider healthcare disparities among people of color, what role might downplaying pros, um, patient reported outcomes from these populations play in disparities, particularly if there appears to be little change upon clinical data? Right. So, so certainly, you know, there's a lot of literature that suggests, excuse me, one second. There's a lot of literature that suggests that um, there is a downplaying of symptoms that black patients aren't believed uh, when they have issues or when they have concerns. Um, so that certainly could play a role in some of the differences that we see in outcome. I think the difficulty is that it just really hasn't been measured, right? So that's one of the things that we hope to get to in some of our studies um, in terms of, you know, the registry and other research, um, you know, to try to better understand what, what factor these things play. And I think the other um, hopeful answer to that is that there are many of us that are uh, avidly trying to recruit more diverse populations into the field of neurology, um, because certainly when we have more diverse providers and, and physicians, et cetera, um, sometimes it can affect outcomes as well. Okay. Um, thank you. So we mm -hmm. actually have um, a hand raised. Um, so I'll go ahead and I'm um, from uh, Jacqueline. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask you to unmute. And um, Hi, thanks, Monique. You're welcome. Hi, Dr. Williams. Thank you for the really amazing talk. Um, I have a question for you that is from my um, science uh, background. I did my yeah. PhD in um, uh, uh, health disparities in African-American men. Um, so I'm really excited about the registry and the study that you talked about yes. um, that mm -hmm. is for um, enrolling Black patients with MS. Um, yeah. For both of those, are you um, planning on 
collecting um, like genetic ancestry data or are you just taking mm -hmm. self-reported data? So you can, I know yes. just getting these patients into these yes. trials and this registry right. is amazing, right. but I didn't know right. if you right. maybe were looking at like the gradient and how that affects outcomes and um, yeah, responses so, so to that, disease therapies. Yes, yeah, so, so it's very fascinating. So, um, you know, so there also is a Hispanic registry uh, where Dr. Mescua and some of my colleagues, Dr. Ankel Chenea and Puerto Rico have really been working on the genetics and looking at outcomes based on different varieties of genetic um, or different genetic variations in the populations. Um, for the actual registry, it's just now um, self-reported data for the African-American registry, the clinical trial will be connect, collecting genetic data. And we have a sub-study of cerebral spinal fluid to better understand um, you know, some of the markers. One of the reasons that we chose ocrelizumab for that study is that there is some suggestion that the B cell pathway um, is more involved with African Americans in terms of autoimmunity. And so um, we're hoping to find out more about autoimmunity in Black people from that study. And we are looking at genetic ancestry in those patients. And it should be 100, 100, 150 to 200 patients that we hope to enroll in that study. That's awesome. Well, good luck. Yeah. I can't wait to see Thank the you. results. It'll be really, really Me important too. work. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Me too. It's a long time coming. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, Jacqueline. Um, we have another question from the chat um, from Mildred. And do you know if any MS patients were in the clinical trials for COVID-19 immunizations? So yes, okay, so yes, there were a lot. So actually, interestingly enough, the COVID trials had probably the closest um, representation population of population um, of, of many of the trials. So in the Pfizer trial, there was about um, 9.4, don't quote me exactly, it was 9.4, I believe, percent enrollment of African Americans. And then in the Moderna trial, it was like close to 10, it was over nine. So there was close to 10% for both of those. Of course, uh, subjectively, African-Americans represent about 13% of the population, at least from the last census. So it was under you know, what we expect, um, but certainly there were pretty significant numbers. There were, there were several thousand um, black patients in both of those studies uh, for COVID-19. Um. We have another question from the chat um, from Casey. Um, where can people find out more about the registry for African Americans with MS? Yes, uh, so I put in a slide there, but it was before the website came out. So I put, I realized I put in an old slide. Um, so the website is, um, and I can also put it in the chat, is www.namsar, N-A-A-M-S-R.org. And so if you go there, that's the website for the registry and you can sign up on the spot. Thank you very much. Um, another question from the chat um, from Angela. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she put, I may switch to um, Oprah I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. You um, did, <laughs> you did. From um, Rituximab. Um, just mm -hmm. to be able to participate in a study. Mm -hmm. So I guess maybe that's more of a comment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we do have time for more questions. Anyone have any other questions? Um, well, I actually do have a question. Um, sure. uh, I was wondering if there's been any studies with any treatments that have been a little bit better for African Americans with MS? Um, mm -hmm. you know, any, I mean, I know probably with the studies, there probably hasn't been you know, a lot just to show if there's one treatment that's better than the other, but I don't know if you've mm -hmm. seen any where it might be a little bit better for you know, an African American with MS as opposed to you know, another race. Yeah, so so we haven't really seen studies where 
African Americans necessarily did better than the general population on certain therapies. Um, you know, we we certainly have tried to examine all the data for most of our clinical trials, which again is hard to figure out what to do with ten people. But there have also been studies that have come out after drugs have been approved. For instance, there was one with. Um, dimethyl fumarate, um, which is also known as Tecfidera, that showed that Black patients did as well as white patients on the medication. Mm -hmm. um, there have been several others that have looked at kind of the subpopulations and suggested that Black people did at least equally as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I have not seen any data where it suggested that Black people did better necessarily on one drug than another population. And there aren't any studies that compare Black people on four or five different drugs to see if they did better on one versus oh, the other. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would love to see that data, but it, it yeah. doesn't exist yet. Yeah. It doesn't exist yet, yeah. It's coming. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, yeah. but not yet, not yet. Okay. We don't have those answers yet. Okay, gotcha, thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. So I didn't see any other questions. Um, I don't know if you had any other comments, Dr. Williams. Oh, well, I see a couple, I see a couple pop that popped up. Um, I know they were asking about, um, would, would they be able to get, see the presentation again and get your slides, uh, which the, um, they will be offered. Um, so I'll let them know. Okay. Uh, and uh, Cheryl asked, um, could you repeat the website? Um, yes, uh-huh. So, yeah. <laughs> It is uh, www. I know we don't put www anymore, but <laughs> I say it sometimes. <laughs> uh, I know namsar n a a m s r dot o r g. Okay, got it. Thank yep. you very much. Um, okay. That's it. Casey put it in the chat. Thank you, Casey. <laughs> Casey's the best. Okay. Um, okay, so You're welcome. Um, and there, there was one more question in there. Mildred, uh, Mildred asked if you know if any of the people in the COVID nineteen vaccine trials had multiple sclerosis. Now that's a great question that I absolutely do not know the answer to. <laughs> you know, I've been asked this at, uh, you know, multiple venues and I've even asked, you know, when I've done talks with some of the COVID experts, they really haven't broken down the data that far. So we don't know which people had autoimmune diseases. We don't know which people had other chronic conditions from the, from the studies. We just don't have that information yet. But I certainly would like to know it. But yeah, we don't know. We don't know how many people had MS. I suspect that from our registries, as people become vaccinated, our registries focused on MS will probably help us better understand, um, you know, what's going on with the vaccine. But but yeah, they haven't broken down the data that far. Okay. Mm -hmm. um... So I saw some other uh, questions pop up. Um, mm -hmm. So Angela asked, um, are there ways in which those of us living with MS can help spur research in key areas to improve um, QOL? Quality of life? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of different ways to get involved in research. You know, certainly um, my recommendation is we don't necessarily, when we talk about research, oftentimes people think about clinical trials. Uh, those trials, although we do need people to participate, certainly do have restrictions, right? And everybody does not necessarily want to participate in a trial where they're, you know, exposed to a therapy, a medication, or exposed to some type of procedure. But there's all different types of research to get involved in their registries, like the African American registry. Um, there are surveys often from different um, places. There are, um, you know, other studies focused on diet, exercise. You know, I think the first place to ask is your neurologist, um, because many neurologists are involved in clinical research. And then if they're not, um, there's not anyone there in your neurologist's office, then I usually recommend people consider looking at um, academic centers or university centers that are near them. Because if they have MS centers, they usually are conducting 
um, clinical research. Other places um, include, I mean, clinicaltrials.gov is kind of hard to wade through, <laughs> but certainly they do have the studies listed there. And then there are other organizations that are doing studies. For instance, um, I Conquer MS um, is a patient-driven research organization uh, where people living with MS really kind of drive the ideas around research and partner with other groups um, to formulate research studies. So that's also a great place to get involved if you want to be actually involved in kind of formulating the research. And then um, other websites that you can look at include, you know, you guys website or the National MS Society sometimes has studies that are listed that are focused on MS. Um, but I Conquer MS is, is a patient driven research organization uh, where people give their opinions about what types of studies uh, they're interested in. And then uh, the group often takes on certain topics and collaborates with other groups to try to uh, get research that really is important to people people who have MS. Um, so I think I have a comment from mm -hmm. Cheryl. Um, uh, thank you. Great presentation as usual. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, and uh, Mildred wrote, um, I have had MS since 1983, um, so I'm not doing the vaccine. So she wrote a comment. Um, and then um, Angela has a comment. Um, Thank you so much. I appreciate you all for engaging my curious mind on all these topics. Virtual. Absolutely. <laughs> great questions. Great questions, Angela. Great um, questions, everyone. And Mildred wrote, thank you so much for this presentation. I live in an African-American position um, desert called Colorado. So good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Nice to see you as well. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm just checking to see if there's any other comments or questions. Um, I don't see any other hands raised. <laughs> um, did you have any other comments, Dr. Williams, before I close it out? Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, it's been a very engaging conversation. You know, health disparities are a really hot topic right now. Right. Um, and I think that although it is in a, in a way sad and unfortunate that many of these health disparities still exist over such a long period of time mm -hmm. and many things have not changed. I do see a real um, opportunity for change. And I see a lot of people that are working very hard to try to talk about these issues, address these issues and see how we can close some of these gaps that we see in the type of care that people receive. So I'm very hopeful and I'm very excited about the work that's being done and just mm -hmm. glad to be a part of it and glad that you guys um, gave me an opportunity to talk about some of it this evening uh, uh, with the people here on the call, so. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I guess that's all the time we have for now. So um, if you missed any part of this conference, um, it will be replayed on msfocusradio.org um, and available on demand on our MS Focus SoundCloud page or our YouTube page. Um, remember to follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information. Um, our next teleconference will be on February 18th at 7.30 p.m. with Dr. Annette Okai addressing bias in healthcare. Um, our sincere thanks to um, all our sponsors, um, all our attendees for your participation, great questions and comments, um, and especially to Dr. Williams. Um, thank you so much for the time you spent to prepare and share this great information with us. Um, so yeah, have a good evening, everyone. Um, thank you again.